I'm in Jerusalem today. Any morning in Jerusalem is a wonderful morning. I spent the last days in a tour with my friend, Brandon Tatum, exploring Israel, doing a seminar. Welcome, Brandon, to Jerusalem. Well, thanks for having me. And we need to clarify behind us, this is not a green screen. Yeah, this is not. <laughs> that is really Jerusalem in the Temple Mount. Yes, it's unbelievable what a beautiful view it is. Well, this was your first trip to Israel, so you have gotten into the deep end of the pool in a hurry. We've been from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea, from the Golan Heights all the way into the desert in the south. What has been your impression of Israel? It's absolutely beautiful. And it's very interesting to see some of the things that Jesus saw. Um, I had this image in my mind of maybe something a little more dim, less beautiful. And then when I came here and I, I could see the Sea of Galilee, it's absolutely stunning. Even in the Dead Sea, it's absolutely stunning. So seeing you know this in real life and not just building an image in my mind yeah. has been absolutely invaluable. And I, you know, I've found it changes our Bibles. When you come see the land and the things we've read about all these years in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the Old Testament, it's not something that's fictitious. It's not Disneyland. There's actually people and places that still inhabit. And it, it changes your whole Bible when you read it. Yeah, it brings everything to life, you know, and especially learning a little bit about the culture of the people here. And you can kind of put it in the context of what Jesus was thinking when he was saying some of the things that he had said, um, you know, kind of the environment, the tone, the tempo, how brave and courageous he was, because when you know the history, you understand what he was up against. Some of the apostles, you know, they were bold. They, they took a stand in the midst of, you know, a, a huge backlash that they were going to get and they did it anyway and and so when you see the city you learn about the people you see it for yourself it, it just brings everything to life yeah i think that's a really important point because when we start to read the book of acts our friends matthew mark luke and john the whole crew they get pushed back pretty quick um, they're, they're still not anxious for jesus name to be celebrated in this city they get threatened and yet they keep telling the story we're getting a little pushback at home and we tell the truth but it's going to take some courage on our part you demonstrate that pretty well. You know, what do you, I think one of the things we take away from Israel is the courage to own our faith in the midst of a culture that doesn't. So are you gonna learn any lessons from the Israelis on that? Oh, a thousand percent. You know, it's, after being here, I got two things that come to my mind. One is that I'm impressed with the Israeli people and what they've been able to accomplish, how hard they work to focus on something that they believe and turn it into a reality. And I'm also disappointed at home that we don't have a similar sentiment. We're not in a, in a position where we are fighting for our lives just to exist. And we still lack the courage in some cases, some people lack the courage in some cases to stand up for the truth. And I do not understand how one could read the Bible, understand the history of the land, and still not have boldness and have faith to walk out, you know, uh, the story of the Bible and the relationship with Jesus. Yeah, I think if we could have the courage of the Israelis at home yeah. in standing up for the truth that we believe, it would change our culture. I think, I, I would say, I think we just need to understand our history. There's a connection here. It's not just that our history as Christians started at just the conception or started when you met your pastor, but the history goes all the way back to all of the things that we've seen here, all the way from David. Our history goes back and we understand the history, we understand the fight, we understand the courage that was needed, the longevity of faith, and we say this is where we started, so now we're walking that out. We, we didn't just start here in, 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 in a, uh, a more comfortable setting, uh, of just simply grace, but there was a history of this that had to come to fruition. And so when we understand that in totality, I think it gives us a better um, opportunity to understand the fight that we're up against. You know, I think the history is so important behind us, this beautiful scene that you see the gold dome there now, which is a Muslim shrine, but that area was Mount Moriah where Abraham brought Isaac. It was the threshing floor of Aruna that David bought for the temple to be built. Solomon built his temple there. King Herod remodeled that whole temple, built the second temple there. Uh, that same mountain complex is Golgotha where Jesus was crucified. So we've got history that goes back thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Then we meet some knucklehead in the university that says it's all a myth. Right. But when you come see the rocks and the city and understand the tell that is Jerusalem, it's not some myth, it's reality. Yeah. We have to have the courage to own our faith in the face of people that deny it. 
And Israel, for me, always ignites that afresh. I'm more determined to go home and own my faith in whatever context God puts us. A thousand percent, Pastor. I think we're on the same page with that. When I, you can see the stones. This is not like somebody can come and make this up. They can come and fabricate it and they can build it. You can see the stones. You can see where they built some of these magnificent things. And you see the layers of culture, you know, building on top of one another. It's, it's absolutely undeniable. And there is no way whatsoever that you can read the Bible, you see the accuracy of the scriptures, and then you come here and see it in real life. And that you, if you cannot believe after being exposed to this, I, I, I don't know what to say. You know, even the secular person that may not be a Christian can still look at that scripture, come back and see the historical connection, and at least understand the authenticity of the book. And then, you know, we have the experience of the spiritual side of it, yes. um, and, and which takes us, I think, a, a, to a further point. But it, it is magnificent to see the stories that you read and go and see the city in which they were expressed in. It's, it's unbelievable to me. Yeah, if you visit Israel and your faith doesn't come alive, I think your faith's on life support. Right. But, you know, there's two things that I know without any question that God is doing in the earth. One is he is establishing the Jewish people in the land that he promised Abraham that he would give to them. And he's doing it much to the frustration of most of the global community. The UN doesn't like it. The nations of the Middle East certainly don't like it. But he's causing tiny Israel, which is tremendously outnumbered by the, the nations that surround them that would wish they would go away. And he's causing Israel to flourish and the desert to bloom. The second thing he's doing is purifying his church. He's not gonna tolerate a church that's corrupt or double-minded or unstable or disinterested or indifferent. And when, you, when I come visit Israel and I see the effort to live in the land, there's no question it's a miracle. Mm -hmm. God established them here. But their young people still serve in the military, both the, boy, the guys and the girls when they graduate from high school. Uh, you were a police officer, you see the police cars running up and down the streets. I mean, it's a sacrifice to live here and it requires vigilance. I know you can feel that when you're here. But at home, we're going to have to have the same determination. Even though God is purifying his church, that message isn't going to flourish without our determination. So I think my prayer is that the American Christian community would have the same willingness to sacrifice in order to let God's purposes emerge around us that the Israelis do to let Israel flourish in the midst of this really tough neighborhood. Right. And I think that I wish that we could. That's why I think it's so important for people to come and see because you could talk all you want, you can show little pictures in a book, but when you come and see this, it, it really changes the way you perceive things. And I feel like if America could understand the history and see it for themselves and maximize it, the 10X what they see here in America, because we're a lot larger. Yeah. I mean, this is the size of maybe California, some one of our smaller states, or one of our larger states. But if we could say, okay, let's look at the winning message here, the winning efforts here, and let's maximize them. You know, I, I feel like that we have, it's, it's almost like even history repeating itself. We went to the Holocaust Museum, and you can see that these things occurred that disenfranchised the Jewish people all the way to internment camps, all the way to death camps, or what they call them. And, and there had to be a, be a recovery period from there. I wish that America could see this, understand what position we're in so we can fight back and learn from what has already occurred so we don't repeat history. Um, so again, I think it's, it's incredibly important to not only know the, the message, but see it and take it back home and replicate the success. Yeah, absolutely. Israel's not as big as California. It's more right, like right, New right, Jersey. Right, right. yeah. It's a it much small. smaller place. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you're absolutely right. I think what happened in the run-up to the Holocaust in so many ways is reminiscent of what we're watching. If you go back and read the, the media reports in that period of the 30s in Germany, the dehumanization of the Jewish people, they were less than. Right. You know, they wanted them separated from society in, in little incremental pieces until finally it was okay with the general public if they loaded them on trains and took them right. off to the camps. And we see the beginnings of that or what could be the beginnings of that at home when they say they don't want Christian teachers, student teaching in our public schools because they're dangerous to the students. Right. Uh, I refuse to allow my faith to be called dangerous in the public square. And the Christians have been too quiet. We're gonna to have to have the courage to say, how dare you? We couldn't say that about any other subgroup of our culture. And when they say that about Christians, they're giving the broader culture permission to dehumanize us a little bit. 
and we have the same rights and privileges under the law that everybody else does. We can't yield that. Right, I think we've become too secularized. It's almost like our, our history, the things that we see as far as the monument, we don't see God in these things. I feel like when I come here, I see God present in all of these historical buildings. The story of Israel is, I see God in all of that. And in America, I just feel like people don't connect, draw that connection. And we need to start drawing that connection. We need to start really understanding the value of being a believer. Amen. You know, the Bible, if you actually believe the scripture and you actually have a connection and relationship with Jesus, you understand the value of the lifestyle. You understand the liberation of what Jesus has given us in a message. How then do we not turn around and implement that in every aspect of our lives? If you were a politician, why wouldn't you believe that the Christian way is the best way? It's, it's time for us to stop coddling and, and feeling like we have to somehow dumb down our faith to appease other people. For me, it's like I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the right way. This is the best way for us to grow, for us to live as a nation. And this is how we got to our success in the, in the past. We didn't, it, it wasn't Islam that got us to where we're at as a nation. The freedoms that we that we observe, all of those things, it came from Judeo-Christian values. Amen. And we have to understand that and begin to be bold in it and apply it to every aspect of our lives. And I think we'll come close to seeing you know, the country turn around like we wanted to. I think we have to do more than understand it. I think we have to recognize God's blessing has brought us liberty and freedom and abundance and prosperity. And we have to honor God. We won't do that perfectly because we're all broken people. But if we deny him because we're embarrassed or ashamed and we want to say, well, God and Muhammad and Buddha are all the same, <laughs> yeah, yeah. then we're going to lose the blessings. You know, God established King David in Jerusalem here 3,000 years ago. And David's story is still flourishing. You know, Rome's gone. I mean, at least the empire of Rome that had such an impact here, and Jerusalem is still flourishing. Right. Our nation's only about 250 years old. If we want the blessing of God, we're gonna have to have the courage to say we will live in a godly way. Mm -hmm. We won't do it perfectly, but God's people have to have the boldness to say we think that's better. And the beauty of our country is allowing us to have the freedom so, so many people have the opportunity to come. There's a lot of people that have an opportunity to come to God. So we have a lot of Christians that profess to be Christians, that are quasi-Christian, which means that they're, some of them are trying, they haven't gotten to the place that they need to be, but we have an army of people that outnumber any remnant of degeneracy that we have in our country. And all we need people to do is to become activated. You know, it's almost like a chemical reaction. You know, you pour something on top of it and there's a reaction. Yes. I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit and the people of God can mix in with the dormant Christians amongst us and cause a, a reaction to where people begin to stand up, people begin to be bold, understand the value of being committed to it. Because in our country, you know, we have people that are kind of like lukewarm with it. They go to church on Sunday and they haven't thought about God not one time during the week. Right. And if we can just come together and stop being divided by denominational principle and come together and say, hey man, our faith in God is at risk. Not our faith, but our exercise of our faith in America is at risk. If we don't come together now, we may miss our opportunity to continue this thing called freedom and have an ability to observe Jesus the way we do now. Yeah, I agree. I think even more, our faith, our freedom and our liberty are at risk. Yeah, yes, not just our faith, because freedom and liberty come from God, not governments. Mm -hmm. Governments always move towards authoritarianism. They want to dictate what's right and wrong and dictate what you can do and what you can't do and what you can have and what you can't have. God's the one who brings freedom. And that's why the church is so important, not to convene worship services. We're the conscience of the culture. And I understand that biblical worldview is not popular in all. It's not that we're preaching hate against anybody. We're saying that the creator of all things has said there's a right and wrong. And we're gonna line up with him and all of our brokenness and our imperfection. My life's not perfect. Yours may be, mine's not. <laughs> but I'm still gonna own that biblical worldview. You know, we were walking the other night past, just down from our hotel and we saw the American consulate. Mm -hmm. and they had the, the LGBTQ yeah. pride flag flying at the American consulate with a big banner bigger than our flag. America's exporting that to the nations. Right. 
you know, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't allow us to fly the Christian flag right. at the consulate. Right. There, there's something wrong with that when they're celebrating that over a value that has shaped our universities, our schools, our legal system. We're going to have to have the courage to stand for what we believe in. Yeah, we can't, and we can't be afraid of persecution. We can't be afraid of losing friends. We can't be afraid of being ridiculed at, for a temporary period of time. We have to stand up. When I went down there and I saw that, I was disgusted by what we are representing to the world. This is, United, this is the United States being represented in this small area in Jerusalem. And what are we putting out there? We're not putting out Christ. We're, we're putting out sexual deviancy. That's what the LGBTQ represent in that flag and what, and what the pride represents in America. It doesn't represent love. It doesn't represent togetherness and unity. If it did, that's what the American flag is. The American flag represents love and all the things that encompass the United States of America, not a separate flag of sexual deviancy. And it, 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 I literally wanted to go and tear it down and rip the thing and set it on fire. I would not do that, but I wanted to because it's not only disrespectful to our country and the people who have fought in our country, it's disrespectful to our God. That's not the way you represent in the Holy Land, in my opinion. You know, you're in Jerusalem. Can you know the history right here? And you have a flag that represents the complete opposite of what we believe. It's, I wish that even in Jerusalem that they would reject that. I know I don't know what the rules and regulations could be, but it's like, you know, reject that. We shouldn't fly that in our country. Right. We shouldn't fly that in, 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 Jer in Jerusalem. I can't believe that they would have the audacity to do something like that. But, you know, that's the times that we live in, and that's why Christians need to stand up. And, and I would argue we need to infiltrate. We should be in positions of power in politics. Yeah. Maybe more of us Christians need to run for office and get into a position of power, and then we vote based on those principles that surround our faith in Christ and not allow us to be just a secular population hoping to be blessed doing mess. Well, I think one of the mistakes we've made at the Christian community at home is we have practiced appeasement. You know, we just think if we'll just tolerate everything and tolerate everyone, that eventually they'll tolerate us. <laughs> but the, just the opposite seems to be happening. The more ground we concede, the less tolerant they become of our worldview. And we're gonna have to have the courage to say, we have the right to believe this in the public square. We have the right to talk about this where we work or in our schools or our hospitals. We're not backing up anymore. Right. We're not gonna be angry or violent or belligerent, but we're not backing up. And I think until we get to that point and we're willing to defend our faith with the same boldness that we see people advocating for all their other worldviews, right. we're gonna to continue to lose opportunities and our children's futures are at stake. So I, I can't just ignore that. I have to find a voice. Right, and I think that we need to also focus on investing and divesting from certain things. You have a school system that's teaching your children to hate God and to not observe the beauty of our country. Divest from that. Take your kids out of the school. And if institutions like Christian private schools or even Christian charter schools are doing the right thing, then why don't we invest in that? Why don't we try to collectively send our children to those schools and magnify them? Even with certain uh, companies, if you are gonna be what we call woke, if you are gonna be anti-Christian, then Christians need to take a real step and say, we're gonna divest financially and you're gonna hit rock bottom because there's a ton of Christians that live in our country. And a, and a lot of them are participating in some of these companies that have turned their back on us. We need to really start focusing on that because money talks more than violence in many cases. Amen. You can't be violent enough to stop a, a Bud Light company or Target from existing. And it's not enough violence to do that and it's unnecessary. But if you divest from those companies and they lose $5 billion in market value, I mean, they're gonna have to start making some real decisions. Uh, same thing in the school system. You start taking your children out of these public schools, what, what are they gonna do? They have no money, they have no support. They're gonna to begin to close down. And we don't have to lift a finger to fight anybody over it. We can do that methodically with a plan and a tactic. And I think it'll be most effective. I, I honestly believe Christians should not have to walk around with a cross in their hand. Let your actions speak more than your religion. Um, everybody can be religious. And that's in, in, some, in some cases, people use that more than they do their actions. If I'm carrying a cross, that means I'm a good Christian, but your actions suck. If I'm carrying a cross and I'm going to church on Sunday and I have this church lo lo logo on my shirt, 
then somehow this is what I represent. But but you're still watching Netflix and you're watching some of these programs that are anti-Christian. And so I'm hoping that, and I tell you what, if I think if if Christians would, like every Christian in America would just take a tour here, I, I, we wouldn't have, our country would not be the same. It will not be the same. People will be reinvigorated and understand the history and carry that history into the United, the United States of America. I couldn't agree more. You know, there's a lesson in Israel that I never, whenever I revisit here, it seems to come back to me. God made a covenant with Abraham that his descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would live in this land forever. It was an eternal covenant. But their right to live in the land was dependent upon their relationship with him. Mm-hmm. That if they ignored God or rebelled against God or they took God's boundaries and they set them aside, if they offered their children to as sacrifices in the Valley of Hinnom that we saw a couple of days ago, they couldn't stay here. Well, if that was true for the Jewish people and the covenant God made with them, and you and I as Christians are a part of that covenant because in Christ we got grafted in, Mm -hmm. what makes us think we can keep our liberties and freedoms in our nation that God's given to us if we choose to live ungodly lives or endorse ungodly behavior? You know, we have to hate people. I'm not saying everybody has to be Christian, but uh, we have to have the courage as the people of God to stand up for what's right and wrong. And I, I appreciate your courage. You have a boldness that is refreshing. And you, you are willing to take the heat that comes for speaking the truth as you see it. And I thank you for that. Um, I hope we can bring some more friends back to Israel. Oh, I wanna bring, I wanna bring everybody that see my face to <laughs> come to Israel. I wish that we could do that because it, it is life changing. Somebody told me that before I came. They said, you know, when you go there, it's going to be life changing. And it, it's life changing in a different way than I thought. It, it's not an emotional thing. It's, it's almost like a, uh, a knowledge thing. It's not, it doesn't make me emotional, although there's some parts that make me emotional. But it's almost like coming home and seeing the truth. Like you've been in a foreign land and they've been lying to you and they've been telling them whatever uh, topics they want to endorsed to you, whatever propaganda they want to push to you, but then you come home and you see the truth. Uh, and I, I, this is a weird analogy, but I, I can think of it as a, a parent. You know, just say you're with one parent, and in our culture, you know, there's a lot of divorce that goes on. You're with one parent, you never met your father before. And you've been living with this parent and they've been telling you all kinds of things. You have this vision in your mind of who your dad really is, what he's all about. Maybe people said he was a, a dirt bag. Maybe some people said that he wasn't, uh, he didn't love you. And then you go meet him mm-hmm. and you see yourself in him and you realize that this is a good man. And this is where my lineage comes from. Mm. Now I'm able to meet my father and my grandfather. And when you, when you, piece those things together, it will change your life forever. And, and in a spiritual sense, I think the same thing happens to Christians. It's, it's like I met my father for the first time, and now I see what my history looks like. Mm. And I can take that and be encouraged and emboldened to go and live out my true purpose from this point forward. And so I, I think that's the, the value in being here. And I hope that we can bring endless amounts of people to see some of the beauties that I've been able to see in the last eight days. Well, if, if people aren't familiar with Brandon Tatum and they want to find some more of your content, where can they do that? Well, if people want to go to Officer Tatum, just theofficertatum.com. If you go to theofficertatum.com, you'll get my website. And on my website is everything that you could possibly imagine that I do. I got my podcast there, my radio show is there, my e-commerce store is there, my YouTube channel is there. All things Tatum can be found at theofficertatum.com. And now they can get an Israel overview there. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be that's going to be great. I, I I think people are going to love it. Well, I thank you for coming to Israel and spending some time with us today. Well, thank you, Pastor, for inviting me, and it's been beautiful. I want to pray this out. God's been answering prayers in this city for thousands of years, and I don't ever want to come here without taking the time to invite God into the midst of our lives right now. So I'm gonna ask you to join me in praying for the peace of Jerusalem and the inhabitants of this land, but also praying for the peace of our nation. I don't mean an absence of conflict. I mean peace with God. If we have peace with God, everything else will find its place. If we're standing in opposition to God, there's no politician, there's no economic plan, there is no solution. We need God's help. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the city of Jerusalem and for the physical reminder that you're a covenant-keeping God and that you're faithful to your promises. 
We do pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the people of this land, that you'll watch over them, that you'll continue to establish them in the sea of hatred that surrounds them. May your purposes burst forth in this place as a testimony to all the nations. And Lord, we come in humility to pray for our nation today, for the United States. We're a land in need of healing. You have blessed us in amazing ways with freedoms and liberties and abundance, and we have rejected you. We've been stubborn and rebellious and ungodly and immoral, and we come to acknowledge that. And I pray that in our churches, you would awaken us again to the authority of your scripture, to the uniqueness of Jesus, and we would have the courage to honor him in our schools, in our businesses, in our hospitals, in our courtrooms. We thank you for it. Look upon us with mercy, even though we deserve judgment. In Jesus' name, Jesus name. Amen. amen. God bless you. We'll see you soon.